Welcome to the Geek to Geek podcast where butterflies flutter by. You did. Okay. Yes. Good job. That was the intro. I'm here now. with your wife. You are my wife. You're your wife. I'm there, Void. There. That's pretty good. I'm Void and I'm here with my guest co-host, your wife, who is my wife, just to confuse everybody, but it's mostly not, me. It's not confusing for anyone except you. That makes it the best. For me. For Yes. I think we talk about this every time. Because I get confused every single time. Do you know what that means? It means, I'll tell you, it means that <laughs> I'm not on the podcast enough. Okay, so you're on the podcast tonight. What are we talking about? No, you already did the intro. I don't even have to do it. We're talking about butterflies because one of the things that we like on this show is being able to geek out about kind of anything. And even though this podcast is very heavily skewed towards movies and comics and books and video games, I mean, let's be honest, there's a lot of video games on this podcast. I love when we get to talk about a topic that's not. So last week was meditation, which I was kind of nervous about and we got an amazing listener response. You have been working on raising butterflies with our daughter and it it just seemed like such a cool topic that we could talk about it's actually only been over just over a month of butterflies think of all the work that's been done and we got them the first week of july and now it's just about mid-august so yeah we've only had them about a month and so much change has happened and it's been so fun to just watch them yeah it's been a crazy amount of work too like you've put in a huge part of your summer like a month of your summer into these butterflies and i mean you've been doing other things too but there are days that have you basically have devoted entire days to butterflies at points yeah usually on the weekends it's it's extra cleaning and then trying to find enough milkweed to feed upwards of 30 caterpillars for i mean by the time they get that's really big they eat so much milkweed and i think i didn't logically think of that when we ordered caterpillars um last winter because you order them and they come and they're like a millimeter long or something like they're not big at all and i'm like oh yeah i can totally take care of 30 of those and when they're all two and a half inches long and they're eating four milkweed leaves a day and they need constant constant food all the time it's a little daunting to think of how much milkweed we actually went through that I had to collect from the wild. Yeah, you had to go find it. And I mean, these they start out like you could probably fit eight on your thumbnail. Like they are tiny, tiny. Like I can't picture a millimeter, but I guess that's kind of what I'm thinking. I'm looking at my thumb like you could fit eight or ten of these things on your thumbnail. Yeah, maybe like half a centimeters. I don't know. They're very, they're very, very small. They're just minuscule in size. And all they do is eat. They just eat milkweed and poop. Yeah, it's like the very hungry caterpillar. It's ex- I offered them ice cream and watermelon. They wanted nothing to do with it. It just was milkweed. just it was just that Sunday. It was a green leaf and it felt good and then another green leaf and another green leaf and it was it, they eat milkweed for 10 to 14 days as they grow and they'll grow up to 2700 times their original size, which is crazy to think about. And it only happens in 10 to 14 days. And it's amazing how you had to go out and get a ton of the milkweed too. Like you had to go find it, but you also were trying to be very cognizant of like not taking all of it from one area because that can actually be detrimental to the wild butterflies too. Yes, we're lucky around here that we have a lot of hillsides and a lot of ditches and a lot of like small pond or marshy areas will have milkweed growing around them. So there's a ample amount of supply of milkweed just around us but you're right i don't want to take milkweed all the milkweed from one spot so i would take a couple from there and then the next time i went out which might be later that same day or very early the next morning i would have to drive a little bit further up the road get some milkweed from there and then later that day go somewhere else so i'm just kind of like hunting milkweed um in ditches and little marshy areas go out with my little shears and pull over on the side of the road and grab some and hope it's not like infested with bugs wash it when i get home and cut it up or put it in a vase with some water and transfer all the caterpillars to it because once it dries up they don't really go searching they're just kind of they just sit there yeah like hoping that new milkweed appears and because of me it did and when they're smaller you have to cut 
the milkweed around them. Like you can't just pick up the caterpillar. So you'd cut it out and then use a tweezers and transfer that piece onto new milkweed. So when you have like 30 or 40 caterpillars to do and you have to change their milkweed every day, it becomes a part-time job to take care of these monarchs. It was intense, but like you were doing it the right way because part of the reason that you started this is because our daughter basically wanted to save the planet, which is, she's she has very, very good goals but she's also nine like she doesn't know what's involved she'll get there yeah she had (laughs) she wanted to save the oceans and the monarchs this summer so i told her that she had to pick one uh because i couldn't do both and i kind of meant that as a joke and she's like oh well if i had to choose i would do the monarchs and i'm like all right so now we have to find a way to help and it's save not, the butterflies, basically. Right, save the butterflies in one summer, which is totally doable. And easier than the ocean when you live in Minnesota. Well, that's you know, yeah, that's true. When we found monarchwatch.org, it was kind of a full package because they have the information, you can order the caterpillars, and they send you to um, online shops and tell you what Um, enclosures are correct and they send you to YouTube videos and all of these different things to just kind of set you up for success. And we ordered two kits to be delivered first week of July because that's when we would have an ample supply of milkweed around us because you have to provide all the milkweed, the whole lifespan of these caterpillars and you don't know how much they're going to eat and they ate a lot. They ate a lot. But like the lifespan is really the interesting part about them, like watching them go from stage to stage. And it came with, and I don't know if this was part of the kit or if you bought it separately, but it's basically like a glorified laundry hamper that you think of for college. But one side, like the side of it zips instead of having a hole in the top. So it's a big enclosure that's made for these caterpillars and butterflies. Yeah. And they can climb up the side because when they go into chrysalis, they generally like to leave the milkweed plant that they're on. They wander off. Yeah, they wander off and find a safe, higher place to pupate. Um, So a lot of ours just crawled up the side and went on the top, which is perfect because you don't have to move those chrysalides. A couple of them pupated on the milkweed leaves, which is fine. But then afterward, you would have to, I would have to take the chrysalis off the leaf and like reattach it to a piece of cardboard or something and pin it up um, where it could be safe for the whole pupation period, which is uh, 10 to 14 days. But then one of the cool parts is that they start to shed, right? And they start to... What is it, molt? Yeah, they molt five times in their larva in the caterpillar stage. And it's really cool to watch because it's just, I mean, it's shedding the skin. But uh, at the end of the body shedding, they actually shed their faceplate too. Because obviously the head grows as well. It's not just the body that grows every time. So they'll kind of squirm their head back and forth until the faceplate comes off and it looks exactly like a superhero mask. No, it's like they're ripping their face off. It's like Persona 5. Yes, it's sure. (laughs) It's exactly like that. (laughs) Do you understand that reference? Uh Uh-huh. Okay, great. You don't understand it all. That's okay. not really. But you can just imagine this little caterpillar just squirm, 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 and then all of a sudden its face just pops off. It's it's, it's it's so metal. It's so cool. Yeah. There's a lot of things that are, like, disgusting and interesting at the same time with their process because, like, they molt and they molt and they molt, and then they get enough, what, is it just enough bulk, enough size that they're ready to turn into a chrysalis? Yeah, it's a strange thing because it's 10 to 14 days of eating and then they pupate but it's something internal that tells them that they're ready to pupate they're either big enough or they're old enough but there are internal structures to the caterpillar that eventually become those parts of the butterfly so it's possible that a caterpillar can pupate too early and then the butterfly actually can't develop because the parts aren't there which is really strange but after the appropriate amount of time They'll climb up, they'll make a little silk pad because they spin silk, which is really cool. It is cool, yeah. And they'll hang upside down from that in the shape of the letter J. So we call those J hangers. And in a day, they'll turn into a chrysalis. But in that 24-hour period, they like loosen their outer skin, which is, I think, one of these disgusting parts that you're talking yeah. about. But they'll loosen their outer skin in preparation of the skin splitting open and this final molt happening. And it just kind of like pumps up and down until the chrysalis is 
revealed, but I'm not sure if it's if the chrysalis is inside or if it's a total transformation that's happening. Because it doesn't like lose the skin like it does when it's molting. It like transforms into it. Right. The like the final It's like layer, a Pokemon evolution. Like it's It's exactly like that. What's the one that in the middle it's just a chrysalis? The metapod, yeah. Yeah. And it's like that is its own thing. It's not that you have to wait for the next part. So the chrysalis is an animal. It's not a caterpillar or a butterfly yet. There is this middle thing that it is a living thing. It's just there. And it's all. weird. It happens so fast too. Like, I mean, I know it because I've seen it before and I understand the butterfly life cycle, but like seeing it in person go from a J-hanger into a chrysalis, it only takes like 30 seconds. And it reminds me of like an anamorph. Like it, it's just like it morphs from one to another in a way that it's rare to see things like that in real life. Yeah, you, I mean, it's everywhere on the internet. You can definitely go on YouTube and see the entire life cycle of a butterfly, but there's nothing like just staring at it in person. It's so cool. You say that it takes 30 seconds, and that, I think you're talking about the emerging part when the butterfly comes out of chrysalis. The pupation takes about five minutes, and then you'll get the really delicate, soft skin. It doesn't turn into the hard green chrysalis that you're used that you think of when you think of a monarch chrysalis it's kind of um, this soft with yellow stripes and it's kind of weird looking and it squirms around and everything yeah because it basically has liquefied itself yeah and yeah it's disgusting it's like cool but it's disgusting it's also so gross but it's like the miracle of nature and also you yes okay that part is disgusting but if you wait two hours it becomes the hardened um chrysalis that looks so pretty it's so fantastic just don't it think is. about what's happening inside yeah and then you have to wait uh you have to wait uh, probably about 10 to 14 days again it's the same length of time as the um as the caterpillar stage and the chrysalis will go from green to black and then it'll slowly reveal the pattern of the monarch wing. That like, part was so cool. Yeah, you'll see the the orange and black. Because it's not really going black. It's going translucent, right? Actually, I don't know if it's going black first and then it turns translucent. But by the time it emerges, it's like translucent so you can see through it. Yes, it's completely clear. And it's super thin, like uh, like peeling glue off, off your fingertip. It's like that thin. And it only takes 30 seconds or so for the butterfly to come out. And it looks absolutely nothing like a butterfly when it first comes out. But in the chrysalis, like you were saying, you can see the pattern like before it even comes out. Yeah. Because I just thought it was super interesting to be able to like you can't see it's not 100 percent like what the wings will look like exactly but it's, it's giving you like a sneak preview of like what the wings will look like after they're out well and keep in mind that the chrysalis itself is only about an inch long you're it's it's crammed in there you're not looking at an entire wing so it's probably about a quarter of this inch long chrysalis where you can see this orange and black pattern because when the butterfly will emerge, the biggest part of the body is actually the abdomen because that will have all of the fluid that it then pumps into the wings because the wings are just crumpled and tiny. Like you saw one just, you know, just emerged and the wings are just tiny. They're, They're like nothing. They're like yeah. almost nothing. It's like a, what, like a fifth or like a sixth of the size of what the wings actually are when you think of a butterfly. Yes. Yeah. And then they just, they hang upside down and they like dry their wings while like pumping their body fluid into them at the same time. Again, disgusting, but also super fascinating. Because it only takes about eight or 10 minutes for it to actually genuinely look like a monarch because then all that fluid has expanded into the wings and it takes about two hours, I think, for them to fully dry. And then they'll start climbing around. And then all of a sudden you have a completely new animal. In, fluttering around. Yeah, inside. just fluttering around. And yeah. you can learn how to tell the difference between male and female, which is really fun for the kids to wait until they start opening their wings. Because it's really easy to tell when the wings are open. And we'll have... One has a spot and the other doesn't. Yeah, males have a spot and females don't. And we had a, we have a spreadsheet where we documented like when they went into chrysalis, when they came out, how many days they were in chrysalis, and then uh, male or female, and then if 
any like special notes or anything about the chrysalis or about that particular butterfly that we thought were crucial. Yeah. Well, and then you get to release them. So like the, you don't release them right away because you have to give them time to like adjust their wings and they kind of like flit around without actually flying all the way first when they're inside the little enclosure. Well, yeah, I mean, they have to learn how to fly. Right. And they don't actually eat for the first day, which I didn't know. So I was worried that if one came out overnight or something, like it wasn't going to be able to eat anything. But they actually don't eat for the first day. They learn how to fly. They kind of climb around a bit. And then you can just, we carry them outside. I mean, they don't have teeth or anything. They're not a scary thing. And if they do, like, start flying around your house, they're not... It's like, a butterfly. It's a butterfly. It's yeah. not difficult to catch very gently. And it's not, um, it doesn't damage, damage the wings to, to handle them by the wings. We never had to, but that's a myth. Like, so the kids could go and kind of scoop one up and, and carry it back outside, which was really cool. Yeah, it was sweet. Like there was one time where you took the whole thing outside, like the whole enclosure, and you just unzipped it because there were so many in the same day. But most of the time, it was p- taking one to three at a time. People would just hold them in their hands or like let it crawl up on a finger and then walk it outside. Like that was so fun to just have like a butterfly in your hand. Yeah, and sometimes you take it outside and they just kind of look around and get acclimated a bit to. Oh, they don't want to leave. Yeah, yeah, they're being outside for the first time. So being a nine-year-old or a seven-year-old kid and having like three butterflies on your shirt standing outside in your backyard waiting for them to fly away it, it's such a cool thing well now every time we see them around the yard we just assume like it's one of our butterflies because why wouldn't it be well yeah we've we've released like 27 butterflies we have three left and one of them actually started turning dark this evening so there's only about a day left on that one before that one emerges it's so close to being done but they're i don't know it's so cool and like one of the things i don't think we've mentioned is that in nature, they kind of suck at doing this process on their own. Like, what's their success rate in nature? Well, it's not that they suck. It's that there's not enough of them to succeed. Because from 1990, the entire monarch population has gone down 90%, 9-0. So we need more monarchs overall. Because a female can lay 300, 500 eggs a day. It's a lot of work. Which is crazy. But only 10% of those eggs will reach adult butterfly stage. So having them inside, if we had 30 to start with and we released four, we've beat the odds of nature. Right. And you've released 20 some, 26? Yeah, 26 or 27. And we have three left. Okay. So we're getting close to 30 here. Yeah. And we don't even know there's still a whole generation of butterflies that are going to have to happen so they can get to migration because... Oh, yeah, because migration is super interesting. You told me about this, and right. I didn't realize. In a spring and summer season, there will be upwards of four generations of monarchs because they only live two to four weeks after they reach adulthood. There has to be a generation of these that go south for the winter and then return. So it's so crazy because the last generation of late, late summer, won't reach maturity. Like, they'll wait for winter, head south, and then spend some time in either Mexico or California, depending on which part of the country they were in. And then when they come back, that's when they reach maturity. They'll start mating and laying eggs on their way back. So since we're in the northern part of their territory for the summer, we might actually be seeing second generation monarchs in the springtime instead of the first generation that went south and came back, which is so cool. It's so fascinating to me. Like, I can't get over it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting to see too, like how resilient they are because the chrysalides, chrysalises, chrysalides. Both are actually correct. Okay, perfect. I got it right every time. (laughs) Um, they They can be damaged and the thing that like you taught me that I didn't know is that even if they look damaged, you have to let them go all the way because they can emerge and they can either be you could get a damaged butterfly. But even though like the chrysalis looks like it's damaged, it might come out perfect, too. Yeah. And I was really apprehensive about doing that because I don't want a butterfly to struggle only to have to euthanize it because we did have to euthanize one that I I dropped the chrysalis I mean, I had to transfer it from a milkweed leaf onto a piece of cardboard, and it's very delicate work with tweezers and everything, and I dropped it, and it kind of cracked a little bit on the top, and I didn't know if that was going to affect the butterfly at all. It was only a, 
a day or two into its pupation. So we had to wait like longer than a week. And the butterfly that came out had really damaged wings and it was missing two legs and the abdomen was kind of stuck. I had to help it out of the chrysalis a little bit, but it was, I mean, it was clear that this butterfly was not going to make it in the wild. So we humanely euthanized it. Which um, does not mean squishing it or like fly swatting it. Like no. you, you put it in a baggie and you put it in your freezer and it that, that'll that do it without yeah. like, you don't want to squish something that you raised from an egg. From an, yeah. And I, I feel bad. Like you can do that. It is, I mean, quote, just a bug, but I... It's a butterfly. Like, it's you worked really hard at it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I've been waiting for this. But on the other side of that is we had one that it went into chrysalis, and then that chrysalis rested against a leaf overnight before I found the chrysalis the next morning. So when I found it, it was completely flat on one side. And I thought, well, of course, this butterfly is going to have, you know, it's going to miss, be missing antenna, and there's not going to be any lower wings, and the abdomen's going to be all messed up, and I'm going to have to euthanize this one too. And it came out perfectly fine. Like, I got up early that morning knowing that it was going to emerge just to watch it, and by the time I got downstairs, it was just chilling. It was just a completely perfect butterfly. So, I don't know, It's a, you have to let all of them go as... Results Just may vary. See, yeah, your mileage may vary. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Well, I'm glad that we got to do it and we got to help butterflies in general. But like it was cool for our daughter and it was a lot more work for you than I thought it was going to be. But it was it was awesome to be able to just like hold butterflies in our hand and release them. And it was a fun summer project. It was definitely that watching them emerge and being able to hold a butterfly in your hand and yes. let it go in the wild that made it completely worth it. I would do this again 100%. I would just not order 30 caterpillars at a time. That was a lot. I'd probably go maybe for 16 or something. And uh, definitely planting a whole wildflower butterfly garden on the side yard with milkweed and everything. I'm really excited about that. Yeah, yeah, that'll be cool. So if anybody else wants to do it, it's probably a little late in the year this year. But if you're looking for it for next spring, what's the website again that we used? Monarchwatch.org. It's connected to the University of Kansas in Lawrence. And that's specifically for monarchs. I know that programs like this exist for all kinds of different butterflies and pollinators are pollinators, but our daughter specifically wanted monarchs. So we got the caterpillars from there. That's probably it for the main topic. We always do geeky off of the week and a couple other things before we get into weekly geekery so i'm gonna make it quick because bj is not here and usually he does this part um but geeky off of the week patreon.com slash geek to geek cast is the easiest way to do that you can go there and sign up and it helps us out a ton around the network this week uh geekitude with ray and joe they actually had rob on from the and sometimes rob podcast who was formerly of the comic box um but they talked all about like rewriting the dc extended universe or cinematic universe or whatever dc calls it these days which was super interesting because those three are especially <laughs> especially Rob and Ray are highly, highly qualified to talk about that. And I think they might do a second part this week. So I'm excited for that. Tea Time with Katie and Chelsea. They talked about when long running TV shows end and everything around that. Um, and of course, you can catch Troidal streaming on Thursday mornings, Capsules J streaming Tuesdays from 8 to 11 p.m. Eastern and sometimes on Thursdays and weekends. And you can go check out the Geekery where... We have a bunch of blog type stuff. So uh, Austin's Dragon Quest quest is ongoing where he writes about Dragon Quest and 13th Story always finds something interesting, usually video game related to write about this week. And he wrote about Fire Emblem Three Houses, which was fascinating because obviously BJ and I are both hooked on it and we will probably talk about it a bunch more next week once BJ is back. With all that being said, it's time for Weekly Geekery where we share what we've been geeking out about this week. And butterflies is one thing, obviously, but what else did you have that you were geeking out about? I'm super into house plants. Yes, I'm aware of this. <laughs> Just look around you. We are surrounded by, so we're in our office slash knitting slash one of our plant rooms, I guess is what happened. We, we didn't know how to structure this room and my desk was there for a while and then that didn't work and then I basically volunteered to go in the corner because it's good for audio to just shove me into this kind of half not really finished closet it's almost an alcove I love it it's perfect and I said you can have the other four fifths of this room and it filled up with plants almost instantly yes yes <laughs> well we let's see um let when before we moved I did not have any house plants I didn't I had maybe if you bought flowers but that's like a cut flower it's and we didn't have great light what whatever so now we're in this new house there's light everywhere and 
I bought a plant and then I bought another plant and then the grocery store has plants so just pick up a small plant and it turned into a jungle and it's amazing. There are so many different kinds of plants. There's so many different kinds of uh, leaves that you can get and shapes and colors and I mean everything. It's really hard to talk about plants on the radio though. I know but we went from zero to 50 and what are you at right now? I know you've gone up and down a couple times with plants and like you narrowed it down or you combined some of them and then you donated some and you gave some to friends and then you bought some more. I haven't asked you lately how many houseplants are in the house right now. I want you to guess because I actually know the answer to this. I just updated my list. I think think it's gone up since then. I would guess 60. Yeah, yeah, 60. That's No, okay, what is it? I can see on your face that's a lie. We have 108 houseplants. What? And some of them are very small, but some of them are duplicates. But oh. so like that right behind you under under that yeah. Monstera adansonii, there are two Scindapsis pictus, but they're in two inch pots. So that only counts as one. Yeah, but right. some of these are not in two inch pots. Some of these plants are in. I don't know. I don't measure pots that Actually, often, but they're you know big. What? We have two ficus altissimas. We have one downstairs and we have this one right here. And they're both in 12 inch pots and they're huge. They're about four feet tall. That only counts as one. That what? That doesn't count as one. We have types of how we have 108 types of houseplants. OK, I'm glad I asked then. Our son has now seven african violets on his desk that counts as one that's not one that's seven but i'm glad that he's enjoying it and he found what he likes he likes african violets and our daughter is liking succulents so she has been growing and propagating and she has a bunch of succulents Mm -hmm. she really likes that and she just got she's been asking for an aloe plant oh my gosh nope 110 (sighs) Okay. Um, She has been asking for an aloe plant forever, and Home Depot and Lowe's always have aloe plants, and they just put out a shipment today. So after we went to our appointment this afternoon, we stopped by Home Depot, and they had gorgeous aloe plants. And she's, I want an aloe, I want an aloe. So we picked one out, and it was $5. So it's fine. And now she's got an aloe for her room. I'm not attracted to an aloe plant at all. I could take it or leave it. It doesn't matter. But she's showing an interest So I am providing that providing the funds for her interest. Yeah. Well, and I know that she didn't ask for it like that either, because that's not our daughter. I'm sure she asked you in a roundabout way from the side. Very convincingly. I really want an aloe plant. I really. Oh, she was just like straight up. No, she's straight up with me. She doesn't have to pussyfoot around like she does with you. But look, I mean, (laughs) it's not it's not really bad. That shelf is empty. That shelf only has one plant on it. The that, shelf she pointed to is not empty. There are two pots on it. I'm looking at it right now. There. Well, I could put those two pots on the bottom shelf where I keep... There's no light on the very bottom shelf. So I put those pots there. Then that, that one is empty. And the space around, that's all empty. But those bins don't have to be there. So that wall is technically empty. This is not at all even remotely true. There are plants everywhere. So most of them are in this room and then... They're also scattered all over the house, basically. There's ones downstairs because we have light all over the house. But also, this is the end result of us saying we're not going to plant anything new outside this year because this summer has been about destruction outside the house and tearing out all the things that didn't work from the old owner in terms of landscaping. Yes. And in terms of landscaping, I'm doing all the work. Oh, I yeah. hundred percent. The the labor part of it. And this isn't like planting new flowers or spraying weeds or anything. This is cultivating the earth of on the whole side yard, uh, removal of retaining walls, moving an entire rock bed. Like a, I would say that's like a 10 foot by 20 foot rock bed that I'm removing all it's a lot rock. of rocks. It's a lot of rocks. Removing all that and then regrading all of the dirt there because we don't want water flowing into the house. This is uh, straying far away from geekery, but I love plants and I'm going to keep collecting them and there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah, that sounds that sounds about right. So I would normally do a bunch of like, you know, games or movies or I haven't actually been reading enough books lately, which is bad and I should fix that. But this week I've had one on my weekly geekery that's been like the back burner because it was evergreen. And it, I just, I haven't run out of other geekery, so it's never come up. And it's been on there for months, ever since we moved. So I thought this was the perfect time to talk about it, because 
you know about this too, whereas BJ would have no idea. And it is the Casper nightstand lights that we have. I love those. I love them. They're one of my favorite purchases in this house. And they're so cool. They're so cool. I actually sent videos to like your mom and my dad after we got them like demonstrating like I sent a little demo and I don't I've never done why would you do that for a night for a night light it's basically a night light but it's the coolest thing because it's I don't know how how do you start describing this it's a, it's it's got, a Casper glow light so it's over engineered you do not need this light nobody needs this light you oh, can go no. buy a $10 lamp and get just as much if not more light this is like something that I saw that I thought was cool and we were buying things for the new house and spent a bunch of money on it. I don't actually know how much they are right now. I want to say it's like $100 per light, and we have two of them. It's not cheap. You yeah. absolutely do not need these lights. No. But we've totally fallen in love with... Yeah, I love it. So it's it's more of a technology piece than a lamp because it is like a wirelessly charged light that you can just pick up and move wherever you want. It doesn't have any cables attached to the actual light. It sits on this charging plate, and... Everything in the light is gesture based and touch controlled. So if you take the lamp and it's it's basically like a cylinder that puts out light all around the cylinder um, and it has a top and a bottom that are completely reversible. So if you flip it over so the top is now on the bottom, it doesn't look any different. Like both ways are the same. And if you guys want to see a picture of this, it's the Casper glow light. You can look it up online. Um, But if you take it and you flip it upside down, then it will turn on. And that's like the basic gesture to turn it on. And by default, it's meant to be a nightlight. So it slowly fades from full brightness to nothing over the course of the default is 45 minutes. But you can go into the app and you can change it to be whatever you want. When there's an app connected to your nightlights, you know you've strayed too far. Yeah, and I love it. It's so great. And you can like change the color temperature of the light. You can change how bright it is when it starts to dim and you can all of these things. So like it's kind of part of our nighttime routine now is like as we're winding down, we flip over one of them. Oh, and this is the other thing. We got two of them. So they're linked together. So if you flip one over, the other one turns on too. And they stay in sync as they go up and down in temperature. And And if you want them to go, if you want them to get darker faster, you just twist it. Yeah, you like rotate it counterclockwise. And that will darken it and then twist it the other way and it will brighten up again. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I love them so much. It's there's so no there's no switch. I mean, if it's time to turn out the light, you just flip it over and then your light comes out. But one of the parts that I have not used yet, but was the main selling point for me, which is kind of strange, is if you pick it up in the middle of the night and give it a little shake, the bottom half will light up very dimly and then it's like a little flashlight that you can you know, whatever, go out into the hallway or make your way to the bathroom. But we don't actually need it for that because we have nightlights in the hallway and in the bathroom. Yeah, and I if don't you know. can't, you're an adult. If you can't make it to your own bathroom, like without tripping. Right. But it was still a cool feature that you were excited about. It definitely. I I do. I love these lights. I love lamp. I, I love the lamps too. I'm. We're thinking about getting another pair for downstairs because well, they're so good. We will get another. Yeah, pair we'll for get. Downstairs. Okay. Well, I, mean, I should just we admit definitely it. will. Right now we have a lamp that is. I think we used it as a painting light, so it doesn't have. It, it's so just it like a bare bulb. Any, it's, yeah, it doesn't even have a lampshade on it. No. We're working on it right now. It's summer break, so we're working on the outside of the house. Yeah, settling into a house, especially a full house like this. A single family home takes a long time, but I love these things. So if you guys ever want an over-engineered light that comes 100% recommended from us, uh, the Casper Glow Light is fantastic, especially if you buy a pair of them and they're synced together and it's just, it's ridiculously cool and nobody needs it. Nobody needs this thing and I love it. Oh, I forgot. There's a peace lily downstairs and a peace lily in the bathroom and I only count that one as one. Yeah, that sounds right. And then there's a domino peace lily, which is a peace lily, but it's variegated. It's got like white splotches all over the leaves. And then that one over there is a silver peace lily. So it looks just like a peace lily, except it looks like the inside of the leaves are painted white. Perfect. Those count as one peace lily under the category of peace lily. That's probably a good place to wrap it up. (laughs) Yeah, you can write to us with comments, suggestions, or feedback. Our email address is geek2geekcast at gmail.com or reach us on our Twitter at 
geek to geek cast you can also find us on our subreddit and slack and discord and basically all the places that bj says half of so i'm not going to remember off the top of my head but you guys know where to find us by now um you can find me at grn mushroom that's green mushroom without the e's on twitter and that is the perfect place to send a bunch of houseplant pictures so that i can hold up my phone to my wife and say here you did this to me this is what my twitter timeline is full of now send him everything you have also if you're willing to send me cuttings of things i'll totally take them and i'll take really Really good care of them. I'm looking for, well, I'm not going to go through my whole wish list right now, but I love plants. Yes. <laughs> so we've been Void and your wife, and that'll do it for this week. See you next week, geeks. Oh, I didn't even get to say that the gift I got you for your desk was a cement poured Bulbasaur planter, and it has a little succulent in it. That's a perfect way to sign off. It's so, it's staring at me. It's so cute. You didn't even say anything about that. I love it. Do you, though? Because it's in the dark right now and it's a succulent, so you should really rotate it and put it back over here by the light. Well, I move it when I record. As soon as we, as soon as I decide that this is done and that they can actually listen to the outro music, which is not yet, apparently, then the Bulbasaur is going to move back over there because I love my Bulbasaur planter. Oh, I need to rotate that aeroid because, oh, it's not an aeroid, it's an alocasia. There's a lot of plants in this house. Hey Geeks, this is Capsule J. I'm a streamer on the geek to geek Media Network. If you like discovering new games and chatting with cool nerdy folks, be sure to check out my channel on Twitch. You can find it at twitch.tv slash CapsuleJ. That's C-A-P-S-U-L-E-J-A-Y. I stream a blend of indies, retro games, and RPGs most Tuesday nights from 8pm to 11pm Eastern, and occasionally on Thursdays and weekends. Hope to see you then! Hi! My name is Joe Hogan, and I'm a geek. And if you're currently listening to this, there's a good chance you're a geek too. So check out my podcast, Geektitude. Each week, I talk with somebody about their geek aptitude. Sometimes I talk to people in a geeky profession. Sometimes it's someone doing something really cool with their geekiness. Often it's another geeky podcaster. But it's always someone who wants to share their inner geek. So join me each week as we come together to geek out about all the geeky stuff we love. And remember, this week, keep it geek. Hello friends, this is Troidal Power inviting you to join me over on Twitch most weeknights sometime after dinner. Video games have always been a social hobby for me, with friends and family crammed together on a couch chatting away while someone holds the controller. And thanks to the power of the internet, I've got my own virtual couch over on Twitch where you can kick back and goof off while I play games. Find me on Twitch by searching Troidal Power, that's T-R-O-Y-T-L-E Power, to snag a spot on the couch. Hello, I'm Katie. And I'm Chelsea. And together we are Tea Time with Katie and Chelsea, a podcast all about pop culture. We talk about books, movies, music, basically anything we want at this point. Yes, we obsess about K-pop. And Keanu Reeves. And sometimes Katie cries on the podcast. Hey, that's rude. But really, we are just here to talk about all the things that we love. So make sure to head over to teatimewithkc.com and geek2geekmedia.com to check us out. And don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to our show wherever you download your podcasts. Bye! How do I announce you again? What's the intro? Are you my wife or your wife? Your wife. Your, your I'm wife. here with your wife. Okay. You're cringing. You're just cringing. No, I'm trying to remember my intro because I don't have my thing in front of me that I read. I read. It's the same every week. You would think I would know it by now. Welcome to the Geek to Geek. Po- geek to. How do you say that? Geek to Geek. Yeah. Geek to Geek. It's almost a tongue twister, but do not. Do you say to or to? Geek to Geek. I try not to think about it too much because that makes it harder. Right. I was just thinking, silly. <laughs> Shouldn't have done. <laughs> Okay, Okay. let me try it.